Um, but before I do, I want to set a little bit of, I, I think anyway, the background um, for Psalm 24, because um, I think it might have been written to commemorate the events that are recorded in 1 Chronicles 13 and 16 and 2 Samuel 5 and 6. Don't worry about them now, read them later. Uh, after David was anointed king and he captured the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites, uh, and he had a great defeat over the Philistines, or more correctly, God did, because David really didn't do very much. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, he celebrated God's victory by bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem in a couple of stages. But remember that in the Old Testament, the Ark in the tabernacle was a testimony of God's very real presence with his people. And it served as a reminder to Israel that God is the one who saved them from their enemies. He established them as a nation and he provided all that they needed. And remember, God had saved the Israelites before he gave them the law, before he gave them the design of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. And from the time of David's great victory and capture of Jerusalem, Jerusalem became renowned as the dwelling place of God. But the ark and the tabernacle with the sacrifices, celebrations and festivals in the Old Testament were always pointing to something greater. They gave God's people in the Old Covenant a glimpse of what God would one day through, do through Jesus on the cross. So the faithful Israelites were waiting for that event, waiting for a Messiah. Today we are waiting for that Messiah to come once more. And it's really important for us to see in David's words who it is that we are waiting for, what he is like and what that means for us. So with that in mind, uh, let's listen to Psalm 24. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, and who has not sworn deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the King of glory will come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord of armies, he is the king of glory. Selah. I missed that Selah up there earlier. This is the word of the Lord. Now let me pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is uh, to have your word, to be able to read about you, to read about your servants faithful in the past. Father, I pray today that uh, my words would, would do you honour and that your people here would hear your word, that they would take it deep into their hearts and minds and that it would affect their lives in ways perhaps like never before, for your glory. Amen. So in Psalm 24, in this celebratory song, I think we have an early presentation of the gospel. A clear picture of Jesus sung as Israel rejoiced that God was indeed in their midst. God was not only just and holy and fearful, he was merciful, forgiving and gracious in his provision of salvation and life. Um, point one on the outline. David begins this psalm in verses one and two by answering the questions who is God and why should we serve him? In verse 1, he describes the world as God's possession. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. 
The whole earth belongs to God, and not just the earth, but its fullness, all that the earth has, all that it has and all it will ever produce. It is all God's. In Psalm 50, God says, For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Our God owns not just the land, the water, the air, animals, plants and birds. He also owns and is sovereign over all people, every man, woman and child. And notice that his sovereignty is not just over his own people, not just over Israel or even Jerusalem, but over the whole world. The term for world here refers to all the inhabited regions of the earth. Everywhere that God has been pleased to allow men to live, there he is to be acknowledged as Lord and sovereign ruler of the heavens and the earth. This has massive implications that shape our view of the world or our world view and of how we view worship. There is not a single nation, people, group or place in this world that does not belong to God. There is not a single moment of the day that is not his. He is Lord not just on Sunday but Monday through Saturday as well and he is worthy of our praise, our worship, not just here in the gathering of his church but at home, at school, at work, in our neighbourhoods, in our stores and our restaurants, in every place, dare I say even in our parliaments. The world and those who live on it all are the Lord's and he is worthy to be praised and worshipped by all people. The world is God's possession, but David also describes the world in verse 2 as God's own creation. Why is everything the Lord's? Well, verse 2, because he laid its foundation on the seas and he established it on the rivers. Our God is the rightful owner and sovereign of the earth because he made it. He spoke and it came to be. He not only established Israel, his people, as a nation, he established the whole world, the universe. This God made us and all things. This God watches over all of creation. Nothing is hidden from him. And this is the God to whom one day we must give an account. Now, I don't know about you, but I think very few, sadly, even those of us who have been followers of Jesus for a long time, have a really good understanding of what our God is really like. So it was a really good reminder, wasn't it, um, to hear Pat reading from Hebrews 12. This afternoon, read the Exodus account, chapter 19 and 20, of how terrified the people were of God's presence. But the warning in the second half of our reading and of chapter 12 of Hebrews is that in going to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, you are at an even more frightening place unless you have the covering and protection of a saviour, Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And David knew it firsthand, didn't he? I hope that you remember that when they were moving the ark, one of his men, Uzzah, was struck down by God because Uzzah wrongly thought that his hand touching the ark would be cleaner than it touching the ground. I'm at point two now, and so in verse three, David poses a most important question because he realises how high and holy, how set apart God is. And he perhaps asks the ultimate question, who then may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? All in heaven and earth must acknowledge that, Lord, that God is Lord and ruler over all. But who can possibly approach and draw near to such a holy and mighty God? David asked this question in the Old Covenant in the context of the Levitical priesthood who would serve in the presence of God in the tabernacle and temple. But it's a question that we must ask as well because we are called to worship God as priests. Peter describes the church in the New Testament in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 as a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. 
Uh, moving quickly to point three now, David begins his answer to this ultimate question in verse four by listing four qualifications, four righteous requirements. Who can go up the hill of the Lord? Verse four, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. So he gives four righteous requirements. Firstly, clean hands. This demands an outward purity, purity in our actions, purity in our activities. Everything we must do and must and make, sorry, everything we do and make must be clean. Everything we have and hold must be clean. Everything we grasp for and cling to must be clean. Secondly, a pure heart. This demands an inner purity in our thoughts, our motivations, everything we think, every reason that we have for doing what we do, it all must be pure. Third, does not lift up his soul to what is false. This demands a purity in our devotion to God and God alone. We are to have a heart and life committed to seeking and serving only God. The phrase what is false here refers to idols, to vain things, to empty things. Idols are lifeless and false. We are not to be people who pursue idols or folly or have self-seeking ambitions or motives. The only way that we can avoid pursuing what is false is to pursue God and his glory first and in all things. And the fourth requirement is that he does not swear deceitfully. This demands a purity in speech. It demands that we do not speak lies, that we are not deceitful in what we say, but always speak the truth. Now, all these are marks of holiness without which no one will see the Lord. As we pursue the holiness that God commands us, And as he sanctifies us and helps us grow in grace, we naturally want these things to be true of us and more evident in our lives. They are a statement of his law. We must have these if we are to serve him and honour him and love him and appear before him. But I want us to pause here because I want us to make sure that we get what this verse is really saying. This is showing us what qualifies us to come into the presence of God, what must be true in order for us to come and stand before the most holy God. I want you to see that David is not talking about someone who does these good things sometimes or these wrong things sometimes. No, he means always clean, always pure, never chasing after the things of this world, never deceitful, the truth and nothing but the truth. Now, some have read this psalm this far and have come to a wrong conclusion. Many people read passages like this that teach us God's law and they pare it down its meaning and recast it into something that they think that they can attain. They pretend that they are better than they really are. God doesn't really mean complete perfection here. I'm not a bad person. Just look at all the good I'm doing. Surely those good things about me will outweigh the bad things that I sometimes do. But consider what verse 4 presents to us. Clean hands, a pure heart, a life that does not pursue what is false, lips that speak only truth. These are God's high and holy standards for those who draw near to him because these are his own very character. But who can meet such qualifications? Who can attain such a high and perfect goal? If we honestly assess our own hearts and hands, who among us can say that we meet any of these requirements? I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but there's no way this can describe any of us. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. If this must be true of us and we are left to ourselves to meet such demands, 
We can only despair, as I think David did when he was composing this psalm. Despair as ones who have failed in every part and are judged to be unfaithful. We are justly condemned in this not only by what we do, using our hands to do what we shouldn't do, thinking what we shouldn't think, saying what we shouldn't say, but we're also condemned by all that we have not done. Everything we should be doing but fail to do, everything we should have said, everything we should have thought. Were we to stand before God in judgment outside the gracious provision of Jesus, we would see written against us a multitude of sins which we never knew, let alone acknowledged. According to Colossians 2.14, the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us would overwhelm us. It does overwhelm us. Because our hands are not clean, our hearts are not pure, our lives are not wholly pursuing God. We are distracted and we are dulled. Our lips are not pure. They are full of cursing and bitterness. Now, if the psalm ended here, we would be, and rightly so, without hope of ever standing before God. Our just end would be condemnation and death. Because Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the psalm, thankfully, does not end here. I'm at point four now. David now considers in verse five the provision that God has made for those who come to him. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. We cannot stand before God on our own in our sin and live. We need a saviour. We need to be rescued. We need to be reconciled to God. Verse 5 promises blessing for those whom God chooses to draw near to him. In Psalm 65 we read these great words, How happy is the one you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. But we might think that these blessings are beyond our reach because of our sin. Well, no, no way. For God himself provides for us salvation in Christ and a righteousness that is not our own. Verse 3 of Psalm 65, just before the uh, verse I just read, reads, Iniquities overwhelm me. Only you can atone for our rebellion. We can have hope. God himself provides a way for us to enter into his presence. Verse 6 concludes the first half of the psalm. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. In other words, God has provided a way of salvation for his people. There is no other way to approach God apart from these qualifications and because we can't meet them, his provision. His provision of a way out, a covering for us. For those who seek God and desire to worship him, this is the only way. And the psalm gives uh, direction for a musical interlude. The word selah provides a moment of reflection, a pause to stop and consider the weight of what has just been said. Who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? Again, in the context of the Old Testament, these were the qualifications for the priesthood. How could they enter the temple in Jerusalem and worship a holy God? Well, they couldn't. They had to be ceremonially cleansed every time. So how are we now in the New Testament, the New Covenant, a people who are a kingdom of priests, how are we to come into the presence of a holy God? Who is able to stand in his holy place? In verse 7, we learn the answer to David's question from verse 3, the one who meets the qualifications of verse 4. Who has clean hands and a pure heart? Who has not lifted up his soul toward vanity and what is false? Who has always spoken the truth? I'm at point five now. Look at who is seen in the last half of this psalm preparing to ascend into the presence of God. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Here the King of glory approaches the gates of the holy city Jerusalem. Who is this King of glory? 
the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And because this is too good to sing only once, the chorus with its question answers repeated in verses 9 and 10, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Who is the King of glory? It is our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Back in Psalm 2, we read God's declaration that, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 2 continue, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Christ is the king of glory. He is the one who ascends into the presence of the Lord to whom God the Father has given the nations as his inheritance. But more than that, he is the one who has come down from that holy mountain, that holy hill of heaven, come down to be one of us so that we can follow him back up that holy hill. Jesus was there at creation. We heard that in John 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him not one thing was created that has been created. So the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to God. They belong to Jesus, the King of glory. So he is to be worshipped and glorified, and in order to allow us to do that willingly and happily, he became flesh and dwelt among us. While David and the whole human race was waiting to go up the mountain of the Lord and wondering how that could even be possible, Jesus was coming down to meet us. Jesus Christ alone meets every qualification of verse 4 and so much more. Only he has perfectly fulfilled the law in perfect righteousness and can ascend the holy hill. Jesus himself said to Nicodemus, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. He alone has clean hands and a pure heart, free from idolatry. He alone speaks only truth. We are told of the Christ in Isaiah 53 that he had done no violence and he had not spoken deceitfully. He is the blessed one of God to whom the multitudes would sing as he entered the gates of Jerusalem in Matthew 21 verse 9. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. It is Christ who went to the cross and became our righteousness and our salvation. It is Christ who entered the true temple, not made with hands, the heavenly temple, to make everlasting atonement for our sins. It is his cross that has removed our guilt and shame. Paul exclaims that God has forgiven us in Christ. Remember that certificate of debt, that overwhelming obligations. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Jesus is our salvation, our mediator. His righteousness alone is how we can even contemplate going up that holy hill. But much more than that, being welcomed into the presence of a holy God as children of the Father. Now, in closing, let me give two brief comments by way of application. For those who are here and don't know God and Jesus in this way, I plead with you today to come to him. You will never, by your own works and efforts, meet the demands of God's perfect and holy law. Your only hope is to find a righteousness that is not your own. And Jesus is that righteousness. In him you can be forgiven of your sin and cleansed and given righteousness. In him you can stand before God and fear no condemnation. Jesus is the only way, the only truth and the only life. I think Mary might have read my sermon earlier. If you are to stand one day before God, and you will, and not be crushed and consumed, condemned by your own sin and misery, 
you must have Jesus in your place. You must accept his righteousness as your own by faith and trust and rest in him. My prayer for you today is that you would see your need for Jesus and for the righteousness that only he can give you and that you would turn to him in faith and repentance from sin and find life. For those of you who are here trusting and resting in Jesus, my prayer for you is that you would stand fast in an ever-changing world, that you would hold firm in the gospel. As you came to Jesus by the gospel, trusting fully and only in him, so walk and serve him by the gospel. We do, of course, desire that God would work in us and produce in us clean hands, pure hearts, a steadfast soul and lips that always speak truth. And this he does as he sanctifies and conforms us more and more to the image of his Son. But we are never justified by the work and the fruit that is produced in our lives. Our standing before God is solely on the base of Jesus and his completed work for us. And so because of Jesus, we don't have to pretend that we are something and we're not. We don't have to be, pretend to be better than we are. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to pretend that we don't struggle with sin. If we say we have no sin, we make God a liar. We cut ourselves off from the gospel and deny the very reason that Christ came to die on the cross. Because of Jesus, we can acknowledge sin and confess our sin and know that God is faithful and just and will forgive us all our sins. So I encourage you today to remember Jesus and remember what he has done to bring you near. In this time of waiting, let me encourage everyone, lift up your heads. See the King of glory entering into the presence of God for you, standing before him as your mediator, a perfect and holy sacrifice, crucified that we might be cleansed, rejected that we might be embraced, and risen again that we might have life and joy in abundance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, indeed it is a, a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Heavenly Father, we are justifiably uh, in your anger and we thank you so much that you have put Jesus um, between yourself and us. You have made him our mediator before you. You have clothed us in his righteousness. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of waiting, this reminder of, uh, of your son, of how he has been and how we wait for him to return. Father, might we lift up our heads and look to his coming. Amen.